We're going to move ahead with our next resident presentation. Ashley Bernheisel, one of our first year residents, is going to speak about subepidermal calcinosis in the ocular adnexa. You ready to roll? You're up. Thank you, Dr. Dollywell, for that last lecture. It was a really nice change and to talk about life and advice, so I appreciate that. I think, uh, I think it might be nice to take a break and uh, have her show us some acupuncture, maybe on, on Dr. Mifflin, um, to get some experience with that. And I'd like to borrow uh, Dr. Warner's fanny pack sometime. <laughs> so um, thanks for all you being here at the end. Uh, so I'm going to talk about subepidermal calcinosis. And how do I, how do I think it's... Oh, I can imagine. Nobody's asked me that yet. So. <laughs> how does she think it's... Use your arrow. Just my arrow? Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay, sweet. All right. Thanks. So I'm going to be talking about subepidermal calcinosis. Um, and first of all, I'll start out, has anyone ever heard of this before? By raise of hands. I didn't think so. So it's, it's extremely rare. Um, and not really well understood, which is why we decided to do a major review and um, a case report to kind of illustrating this. So to start out, uh, calcinosis cutis uh, is ca characterized by abnormal calcium deposits in the skin, and it's divided into five subtypes. The first one is dystrophic calcinosis, and that is basically when there's some kind of damage to the connective tissues. Um, most classically, Crest syndrome, and the same kind of cal uh, calcium deposits that occur uh, with a tumor growth or with trauma. And there's also metastatic calcinosis, and that's kind of any kind of calcium deposition in the skin that is secondary to calcium or phosphorus abnormalities. And then you have iatrogenic calcinosis, and this is most classically with um, giving IV calcium gluconate or calcium <clears throat> Uh, chloride, which is used um, back in our, in our medicine days, and often you guys remember this, using it to stabilize the cardiac conduction system in situations where there's hypermagnesemia or hyperkalemia. Um, and then calciphylaxis is almost exclusively occurs with end-stage renal disease and dialysis, and that's when you have deposition in the small vessels um, in, this, in the skin and end up with necrosis. The last one is sub subepidermal calcinosis, which is idiopathic and what I'm going to be spending most of the time talking about today. So some other so there's there's basically five synonyms for this, which makes it also hard to look into uh, cases. So other names for this is subepidermal calcified nodule, idiopathic calcinosis cutis, cutaneous calculi, localized cutaneous calcinosis, and solitary nodular cal uh, calcification. So what do we know about uh, subepidermal calcinosis? A lot of this is based off of uh, uh, what dermatology has done and um, looking at lesions all over the body. Um, we know that there's a low incidence, as I've already mentioned, um, and that these lesions are typically, um, at least in, in prior publications, uh, shown to be hard, freely mobile, and painless. Usually in children, and there seems to be a predilection for males, and in, predominantly in non-Caucasians. And again, this can be ruled out by the presence of um, abnormal labs. So some uh, lesions that these have been misidentified as, and again, this is talking about not just the eyelids, but um, the skin throughout the body, and that includes papilloma, xanthogranuloma, syringoma, milia, pilomatrixoma, <clears throat> epithelial cysts, cutaneous horns, chalazion, molluscum, and xantholasma. So I'm just, I wanted to go through some of these um, photographs of these that it, they have been misidentified as uh, to kind of give you an idea um, as, as to why they were misidentified as that. Um, and there's going to be a quiz at the end, which I, I was told you have to get a 90% on in order to get CME credit, so, so, so pay attention. 
so here we've got molluscum, and uh, I chose to put it with xanthogranuloma because they both have that very round appearance. Um, it's hard to tell from this picture, but if you were to look under the slit lamp, as you all know, you would hopefully see that umbilicated center. And the xanthogranuloma are usually a little bit darker pigmented um, and, or, or can be like an orange or red color. <clears throat> and then pilometrixoma. Um, this is a, another rare benign uh, disease. And it's, it's usually a genetic disorder of the uh, hair cells. And here you can actually see that there's also calcium here. This kind of makes sense why um, this could be misidentified as idiopathic calcinosis. Um, but you can see that there's variable presentation with even um, this eyelid lesion. So uh, here, these are just you know, various papillomas or epithelial hyperplasia. There's a lot of different other, there's different lesions that fit in this category here of Veruca um, and a seborrheic keratosis. Here's a, a syringoma and amelia. You can see kind of how those might be confused. Um, these look like a little bit more superficial. And then we have xanthelasma and then epidermal inclusion cysts. So these are all things, again, um, that people have assumed to be uh, idiopathic calcinosis at times. So our questions for this review, were, and looking just specifically at the eyelids, were, are the assumptions about demographics correct, specifically looking at eyelid lesions? Um, where are these occurring around the eye? What do they look like? Is, do we know anything about the pathophysiology, or does anybody know? And what about the histopathology? So we did a search in PubMed, Scopius, and Google Scholar, and looked for the keywords subepidermal calcinosis, subepidermal calcified nodule, calcinosis cutis, idiopathic eye and eyelid. We looked from 1952, which is when it was first described, to 2016. We found 57 citations, and we had these independently reviewed by two readers. We excluded 36 because of non-ophthalmic presentations, and one was excluded because the um, histopathology was indeed an epithelial inclusion cyst. And so we ended up with 10, sorry, excuse me, 20 case reports and case series and a total of 47 patients. Um, and within those patients, some of them had several lesions. So our results, we found that indeed, um, this mostly occurs in males. Uh, 64%. Uh, the age of presentation, almost 90% occur in individuals less than 21 years old. Um, as far as race, we found like there was a good distribution across races. <clears throat> as far as location, uh, upper eyelid was the most common with the medial canthus being the second most common. 80% showed with a single nodule, whereas um, very few had bilateral or multiple. The size was typically very small at less than five millimeters, and none of them were larger than 10. And um, interestingly, the time to presentation uh, was 75% of them took over six months to be seen. So looking through these, we found that uh, almost all of the cases show calcium deposits in the upper layer of the dermis. And the calcium deposits were these amorphous basophilic spherules that were seen on H&E stain and could be confirmed with von Casa. Occasionally, there were giant cells and inflammatory cells in the specimens, but that was not very common. And that the overlying epidermis could be hyperplastic, hyperkeratotic, or acanthotic. So here's a, a classic example. Um, you can see the, the epithelium here, and under this is low magnification, but here are those, those H&E spherules that show the calcium, and uh, here on, on von Cossa, you can see the calcium more clearly. And this was from one of the cases that we included. So okay, just re look at these really quick. These are the ones that it could potentially be for this next quiz. I'll just give you a few seconds to look these over. <laughs> So you can notice they're quite different, but these are actually all, all idiopathic calcinosis. So I actually didn't really realize how significantly different they all appeared until I was putting this presentation together. Um, and we haven't published this information yet, so it's something that I actually did kind of a post hoc analysis just in the last couple of days looking at this. So and even in one, this is the same patient 
this uh, one was on this this one's on the upper the the left upper lid and this is the the lower lid on the left side you can see how different the appearance is externally um, but they both ended up being idiopathic calcinosis so looking at the ones that did just kind of some of them don't describe very well what they look like uh, but the ones that do I found that nine out of twenty seven so um, over, uh, exactly a third of them ended up having uh, papillomatous features. So quite different from what was published um, and what was understood to be throughout the rest of the body. Um, and then the, the other most common were nodules and cysts, but there was again a large variety in how they presented. And so, the, and, and actually one interesting thing was that uh, this publication that had, was, had nine of the cases um, contained all five of the descriptions um, as cysts. So this is kind of what they thought they were. Um, and there was no, there's no other publication, there's no other case reports that anyone thought that they looked like cysts except for five out of these nine. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So as far as what causes this, we really don't know. It's, it continues to be poorly understood. Some of the proposed mechanisms within uh, these case reports and case series or that this is sec possibly secondary to mast cell, mast cell activation, preceding nevi, stromal degeneration, calcification of sweat ducts, um, or preceding lesions. But pretty much everything has been debunked other than mast cell activation, which, I, which still doesn't really have a strong case because only uh, a handful of them end up having mast cells in uh, the histopathology. And the thought is that if it was due to mast cell activation, that they would have some predilection to, to allergies or some atopic dermatitis. So treatment um, is complete surgical excision. Um, pretty much everyone, uh, all of the reports show that, that that was what was needed to be done. Um, a few of them had uh, recurrence after incomplete resection. A few other... <laughs> Things were attempted, including topical steroids, CO2 laser, saucerization, followed by electrodesiccation and systemic corticosteroids. So other than electrodesiccation, all of these failed and eventually had to be followed by complete excision. So the case that I'm going to talk about real quick, it just kind of, it's unusual in that, first of all, looking right at the beginning, it's uh, a 61-year-old female, so kind of out of our usual demographic. Um, but she, it's not impossible that, you know, there is a, a variety in presentation. She uh, had, came in with complaints of right eyelidosis, and she did say that she noticed five years prior to coming in that she noticed some uh, eyelid thickening. She had no history of trauma. Um, she did feel like it was uh, tender to palpation, and uh, she was otherwise healthy, had no other past medical history. Uh, she did take some vitamins and occasional ibuprofen. So uh, her best vi corrected visual acuity was 20-20 in both eyes. Her pupils were normal. She had full motility um, and visual fields, and her sl slit lamp examination was unremarkable. Uh, she did have some overlying vascularity on the, the upper lid, um, some erythema, and there was concern that this could be uh, sebaceous cell carcinoma due to the, the thickened eyelid and kind of the, the yellow and inflamed appearance of that lid. So here's her appearance. Again, you can appreciate the ptosis on the right and kind of just the really thickened eyelid, potentially losing some lashes here, some erythema. So um, just to compare, you know, this is a pretty angry sebaceous carcinoma, but this is kind of what we were worried that it could become. So it was surgically excised. And we found that it was, uh, Dr. Patel found it was connected to the upper margin um, of the tarsus. And uh, histopathology, so at 40X you can see the, the tarsus right here and then kind of in the center some of this, these uh, calcium granules. And at 200X you can actually appreciate that these are spherules. And calcium. We did not do von Koss staining, but didn't feel like we needed to. It's pretty straightforward. So the ptosis was repaired at the time of surgery, and she has not had any recurrence. She's about three years uh, post-op now, and, and she's doing great. Um, and luckily, could give her the good news that she did not have sebaceous cell carcinoma. So in conclusion, uh, subepidermal calcinosis should be on the differential. 
um, when you're looking at lesions of the eyelid. It might be something that you know you don't think about, but um, can present in many, many different ways, as you've seen. But it particularly should be considered in young males with no history of systemic disease or laboratory abnormalities, because um, people are going to want to know an answer when there's a, when there's a bump on their, their kid's eyelids. Um, so it's most typically on the upper lid, it's solitary, usually solitary, less than five millimeters in size, and typically chronic. Um, like I said, the, the presentation and appearance can be variable. Um, and you have to con con uh, confirm diagnosis with biopsy and histopathology. Like I said, treatment is always excision, and the pathophysiology remains elusive. And I want to, so this was done as a, with a, as a collaboration between um, us here at the Moran Eye Center and uh, with Dr. Dutton and Dr. Uh, Kine at UNC. I don't know, Dr. Dr. Dutton, if you look at our BCSC, has illustrated a lot of our, uh, a lot of our pictures. Um, so it's been fun to work with them. And any questions? All right. I agree. No comment. <laughs> DB, I had a paper just submitted to me for review from Sweden, acupuncture for face things. Here's the interesting thing. Before and after pictures look exactly the same. 92% of the all women thought they looked better. But I'm still deciding whether to accept it or reject it. Complete failure in objective assessment, 100% success in subjective assessment. Only I think that's more important, honestly, the subjective. It's my way. We had objective testing of the vision. It wasn't just a subjective feeling. No, no, I'm, I'm sure. I was, uh, <laughs> I would like to see that lady could see so clearly with the clear distance, no glasses. It's also refractive surgery. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right.